this is rocuronium versus uh, succinylcholine. Um, beginning of the chapter basically gives a pretty good grid that talks about what are the side effects, onset of action, how long it's going to last. So not, not a bad table in regard to its pros and cons. The first article, first two articles actually look at the use of atropine. Um, a lot of people advocate using atropine in children that you're going to paralyze. One, because just waving the laryngoscope in front of them will make a lot of kids bradycardic. And two, the paralytic agents themselves, specifically succinylcholine, can make kids bradycardic. Nobody really knows why. Maybe it induces some parasympathetic effects. But the teaching has been to always give atropine, especially in younger children, maybe less than five years of age. So the first article actually came out of our department. Bethany Fleming was, is now a resident in our department. She was a medical student. Um, we get a lot of medical students in our department running around doing all those projects, trying to impress us to pick them for our program. And she basically went through all the literature and looked at all the, the pro and kind of the con articles looking at the use of atropine for children. And basically what it found is, yeah, kids do get bradycardic when you paralyze them, but the bradycardia is not all that important. It's transient maybe a few dips in points, maybe some profound dips in points, 10, 20 points in the heart rate, but then it comes right back up. And it was funny, she also put in there, kids get bradycardia, and this has been substantiated in, uh, in hospitalized patients already on a monitor, when kids hiccup, when they poop, they go bradycardic. Like, who's giving atropine for kids pooping? Like, nobody. And NG tubes, when we drop an NG tube down, and we do that a lot in children, nobody's giving pretreatment with atropine, yet those kids will go bradycardic. It's all very transient. So her argument was, these kids have bradycardia with normal kind of GI process and systemic processes like hiccups. We do procedures like NG tubes. Why are we picking something like intubations as a reason for giving atropine? She also looked at, at a lot of the studies out there. What she found was that it's really the second dose, third dose of succinylcholine. Once you start getting to multiple doses of sucks, then you're much more likely to get bradycardic. Not a lot of evidence that just the first dose alone will cause a profound, or a profound bradycardia that somebody needs to do something about. In Australia, they actually surveyed a lot of anesthesiologists, and upwards of 80% of them don't use atropine, at least on the first dose of sucks. They save it for subsequent doses of succinylcholine. So again, the teaching here was that pre-medication with atropine is probably unwarranted with single dose, that atropine alone can induce ventricular dysrhythmias. It may bred um, my big issue, and I know when I was a fellow Doing, I did a Peds Emergency Medicine Fellowship about 14 years ago, and the, the Peds intensivists I work with, the Peds anesthesiologists I got to see during my fellowship, a lot of them were already kind of pro this, not really using atropine, especially for little babies. They wanted to know if the kid's heart rate went down, specifically because it was probably related to hypoxia. They didn't want to mask that. They wanted to be able to see if it was there. So a lot of the people that I grew up learning from didn't really use atropine. Article number two, published last year with 2007, basically looked at two articles, again, looking at sucks with and without atropine. The first one was a blinded study, 41 kids getting elective surgery, no difference in their um, mounting of bradycardia with or without atropine. And the second was a retrospective study of 143 kids, newborns to 19. Again, it's not the 19-year-olds that we're really worried about, it's the little babies. Rapid sequence innovation with and without atropine, really no difference in whether or not they got atropine in the development of bradycardia. What about lidocaine? Article number three is really one of two articles that came out in the same journal, January 2007 of Annals. It was kind of a pro and con for and against the use of lidocaine. And what's interesting, if you read, so what you got is the against. This is by Villancourt, January 2007. In the same issue, January 2007 was an article kind of pro or trying to give you leaning toward the use of lidocaine by a guy named Sali. If you read both articles, they pretty much quoted the same articles. They just had a different spin. So both of them would say, hey, lidocaine, the people that were for it was like, yay, lidocaine blunted that increased ICP effect, which is why we're giving this lidocaine. The people that were against the villain court article that you have said, okay, so the you know, ICP went up a few points and didn't go up a few points with lidocaine. Clinical outcomes, not all that different. No one's really following these people long term in the ICU or their neurological outcome to say that transient rise in ICP based on intubation or NG tube suctioning or whatever it is that we think we're doing to patients to increase their ICP, is it really that bad to have it raised for a few minutes? And so it was interesting looking at both the pro and the con. They both looked at the same articles, the same studies, and looked at it with a very different spin. Article, article number three looked at um, several articles. One was a randomized controlled trial with brain tumor patients where they got IV lidocaine during the surgery. And it, it blunted, but it did not eliminate that increased ICP with intubation. There's smaller studies looking at the suctioning of brain tumor patients and intubated um, brain trauma patients. And when you suction a patient, their ICP does go up. Yes, lidocaine blunts it a little bit. But again, neurological outcome from having your ICP rise for a couple of minutes, 
not really good data out there to say whether or not we should be blunting it. There are side effects to lidocaine, particular dysrhythmias. It can drop your blood pressure. And if we relate the mean arterial pressure to the intracerebral perfusion pressure, dropping your blood pressure may be more clinically important and have negative outcomes compared to any benefit that we're getting with lidocaine. So I'm kind of a proponent of not using lidocaine, but if you want a really kind of pro and con um, article, look at this issue of Annals of Emergency Medicine because it has a very good um, review of the literature. Article number four, I didn't think really um, applied to emergency medicine. It was a Saudi Arabian article looking at what's the optimal dose of succinylcholine. And what they found was, yeah, you could lower the dose of succinylcholine, and most of the patients would then have still optimal conditions for intubation. They compared 0.3 milligrams to 0.5 milligrams to 1 milligram per kilo of sux compared to placebo. And if you looked at the outcomes, either excellent or good clinical conditions, the patient was relaxed, they didn't cough, their vocal cords were kind of nice to be intubated. If you had 0.3 milligrams, it was about 92%. If you finally went up to one milligram per kilo, it was 98%. For us in the emergency department, and they also said the reason they were looking at lower dosages was because the more, light, more succinylcholine you give, the harder it is to wake somebody up. Your recovery times were longer. Well, I don't know about you in the ER, but I'm not intubating people on the assumption I'm going to extubate them while they're still in the emergency department. I want them out. I want a successful innovation the first time I do it, because I know they're going off to the OR or off to the intensive care unit. So for us in the ER, we're looking for the biggest bang for our buck right away. So for me, I always give two per kilo, just because you're remembering one and a half for adults and three per kilo bigger volumes of distribution for neonates if you have to use it on them. So for me, I just give two per kilo for everybody. So if you were in the OR and you were going to extubate people in a short period of time, yeah, it looks like you could use smaller doses of sex. But for us in the ER that we want success the first time we do it, 100% success rate, use the higher doses of succinylcholine. Article number five looks to the issue of hyperkalemia. Again, there's a thought when you use succinylcholine, you can have a transient rise in, in potassium. This was a review article out of Duke University. They looked at 41,000 cases of succinylcholine being used in their institution over about a six, seven year period. 38 cases actually have potassiums greater than 5.6 that they knew of going into these, these intubation situations with a mean of about 5.9. Five of the 38 case, cases were children less than one year of age. And they found, you know what, these patients did okay. According to the charting, there was no you know, active um, trying to get the potassium to come down while the patients were being intubated or, or thereafter. They used the standard amount of succinylcholine, one to one and a half milligrams per kilo. They used no depolarizing muscle relaxant beforehand. Um, they, and they said no charting of dysrhythmias, no disproportionate morbidity compared to other patients, and no unexpected ICU admits. Their confidence interval was upwards of 8%. Even though this was a large study, 41,000 patients, they still didn't have a whole lot of patients based on them on just having hyperkalemia. So they said, you know, it seems fairly safe for even patients with mildly hyper, um, hyperkalemia or elevated potassiums upwards of 6 were probably okay. I think if I had a patient that I knew walking in, their potassium was 7.5 or 8, which is not our information a lot of times when they're getting these patients in from EMS and we're intubating them right away. But if I knew their potassium was wildly elevated, I might not give it. But this says for transient or for mildly increased potassium, it seems to be fairly safe. And their upper limit there was um, 6.0 that they thought it was OK. What about fasciculations? Um, succinylcholine and fasciculations, these were two articles. Article number six basically looked at using one of five non depolarizing agents before you give succinylcholine. So the patients all received sucks one and a half milligrams per kilo. This was elective surgery. And then they were pre treated, kind of randomized with a wide variety of other non depolarizing agents. And when they looked at fasciculations, specifically that entity, there were a lot fewer fasciculations, fewer patients had fasciculations in the patients that had been pre treated with some type of. of of um, non-depolarizing agent controls. Almost all of them, 19 out of 20, developed fasciculations. And then you can see the numbers down, down to Rocky Ronin, where only three of 20 developed fasciculations. My allergies, the next day, there was no difference if you gave a non-depolarizing agent. Article number seven, 2005, was a meta-analysis looking at the same issue, the development of fasciculations, the development of muscle, of, of myalgias the next day. Fasciculations, on average, if you just give succinylcholine alone with no attempt at, at ablating them, average is about 94%. Myalgias, again, in all these studies looking at the control group where nothing was done to try to prevent or minimize the myalgias the next day is average about 50%. So almost 100% of patients will get fasciculations, about half of those will develop myalgias. And they went through all the studies and all the different therapies and what they found was you could decrease 
fasciculations. There are entities that will do it out there. Benzos seem to be effective, but not as effective as other agents. Non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockades, at least in this randomized control trial review, seem to be fairly effective. NSAIDs, they said, didn't really help with the fasciculations. But in these randomized controlled trials, the muscle pain, the myalgias of the next day, actually seem to be fairly effective um, via the use of um, NSAIDs. The numbers needed to treat were only two and a half. That was the lowest. So NSAIDs seem to be fairly effective. You could use a sodium channel blockade like lidocaine, again, using some type of non-depolarizing um, neuromuscular blockade or benzo. So there are ways, if you're going to use succinylcholine, there are ways of, of kind of preempting the fasciculations or the, uh, the muscle myalgias the patients get the next day. There's a new drug on the market. I was just asking Rick if he knew it was approved. It's Sugam Sugamatix. Um, I Wikipedia'd it or Googled it. It's just, it's a, basically, it's a new reversal agent for the muscle relaxants. Basically what it does, it encapsulates the muscle relaxant, as I understand, the muscle relaxant molecule. It forms a tight complex and basically removes it from the area. Um, last I checked, which was about an hour ago, um, it was applied, the company actually applied for FDA approval in January 2008. From what I could tell from the internet, I don't think it's been, anybody know if it's been approved yet? I don't think the FDA works that quickly. Um, so five months later, I think it's still kind of on the docket to be looked at. Um, but it seems to be, at least, at least for our anesthesiology friends, it seems like it's going to be fairly effective. University of Texas, this is article number eight, published last year, again on this new drug, 60 patients going for elective surgery. They all got rocuronium, and then 15 minutes later, they got one of three different type of reversal agents, including one of these new ones, the Sugamatix. Something called the time of four, the train of four, which is basically an electrical impulse is given to the patient. Theoretically, if your neuromuscular junction is intact, you'll get some type of muscle activity. That's what our anesthesiology friends use as their indication that your anesthesia is good or that you're waking up. And their time to the train of four was much better if you use the Sugamatix. 100% of patients by the time within five minutes have this reversal of kind of their, their paralytic um, um, effect, at least when the train of four um, as a, as a, uh, a benchmark. Uh, Neostigmine and the other ones were just not as effective. It took a lot longer for them to wake up. Dry mouth was a side effect of the Sugamatix, but not as much as with the other drugs. Or sorry, it was much less compared to the other drugs. So maybe something that we'll see, again, probably the, the uh, Drug representatives will try to push this to be in the emergency department. So it's something, again, side effects, things like that. At least it seems more effective in regard to reversal of these agents. But we're not doing a whole lot of this reversal in the emergency department. Another article, article number nine. This was, again, looking at um, which, which drugs are more successful. Which one is rocuronine compared to succinylcholine? Rocuronine is out, and it's out there and available. It's nice having an alternative, but should we be switching it completely? This was a European study funded by Organon, which produces rocuronium. This was after propofol. They got either rocuronium low dose, 0.6, or one per kilo, which is I tend to use as one per kilo, or sucks one per kilo. Again, you could argue higher doses of succinylcholine. Look at things like jaw relaxation, vocal cord paralysis, all the kind of thing that you want in regard to excellent conditions, good conditions, or poor conditions. The first was 94 patients in a randomized study looking at two different doses of the rocuronium, either 0.6 or 1. Excellent intubation conditions were more likely with the higher dose. Again, in the emergency department, we want one shot. We want that patient intubated the first time. We don't want to dick around with giving more or adding another drug or having to wake the patient up because it was an unsuccessful intubation, right? When we need to intubate somebody, we have to do it. We don't have the alternative of canceling the case. If you look at a lot of those anesthesia algorithms, right, for the difficult airway, what's their bottom line for anybody that's got a difficult airway? Cancel the case, right? And we don't do that in the emergency department. We have to get the patient intubated. So you want as successful, um, good, excellent intubating conditions as possible. And it seems at least higher dose, at least of succinylcholine, is the way to use. Rocuronium, again, higher dose, more successful. 0.6 compared to one per kilo. One per kilo was much more successful. So if you can use rock, use more of it. 272 patients were also looked at in the study compared succinylcholine compared to one milligram per kilo of rocuronium, and they seemed to be pretty good. The intubating conditions, either excellent or good, were similar in both groups. Rocuronium was about 93%, and succinylcholine was about 97%. A couple more articles, again, looking at just the use of rocuronium. University of Davis, article number 10. This was 521 patients who got rapid sequence innovation in the emergency department. They encouraged them to use rocuronium in those cases where we've always kind of been hesitant or a little worried about using SOX, known or suspected hyperkalemic patients. So if a patient comes in altered and they've got a dialysis shunt in, 
that patient, I might worry about what their potassium is. Intracranial injuries, crush injuries, the non-acute burns, the ones where we think sucks may be a problem. Rock your own. I mean, this study, again, they were encouraged. It wasn't randomized. It was kind of pick your drug that you want to use. About a quarter of the time rocuronium was used, it was mostly for known or suspected hyperkalemia, which is about half of the cases when rock was used. The time to paralysis, about a five second difference. I don't know, I can wait five seconds, probably not a big deal. Both drugs had almost complete body and vocal cord paralysis, which is what they were looking for, and yet the doctors liked rocuronium better. They couldn't figure out from the data why. They both had great vocal cord paralysis. They both had excellent intubating conditions. Both the patients did. I mean, they couldn't figure out why, yet when they overall satisfaction, the doctors seemed to like rock better. Article number 11 um, looked it was at a Turkey and Tufts University. Again, they did a whole meta-analysis, looked at all the randomized cardiac trials. Most of them were OR cases, looking at kind of low-dose sucks, one to one and a half milligrams per kilo, compared to rock low dose to 1.2 milligrams per kilo, so kind of low to high or medium to high doses of both. They got excellent innovating conditions, again, with sucks compared to rock. Better with the sucks, again, how many of the rock cases got 0.6 milligrams per kilo compared to the sucks cases that go 1.5? Not really said in this article. Unacceptable conditions, more with the rock uranium. Again, lower dosages were also used. And they had no report of clinical important vital sign changes or side effects. So rock uranium is out there. It is an alternative to succinylcholine for the patients that you're worried about. But it doesn't seem, at least from the literature, that we should completely abandon succinylcholine. It's still out there and a very viable option. Any questions? How many of you guys don't use atropine in children? I don't necessarily do it. Yeah, see, I think that's kind of the, I'm speak, preaching to the choir here. Yeah. <coughs> uh-huh. Let me look. Um, you know, I don't have the, I just have my notes from the thing, but I looked, I looked at the articles and I saw, I don't remember seeing that point, but I saw the other points about the, yeah, it doesn't make any sense that normal saline placebo would. Part of, remember, this is an abstract of somebody else's interpretation. It's not the real abstract of the author. So I've seen some other typos and, miscommunications in some of these abstracts. So I'd have to go back to the original article. I don't remember, when I read the article, I don't remember that as standing out as a point, because that would be interesting if saline would work as well as other drugs. Any other questions? 